Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our special guests from Israel, John Medved, the founder and chief executive of Our Crowd, and Dr. Morris Laster, physician, entrepreneur extraordinaire, and Our Crowd venture partner. To our viewers all over the world, if during the course of this conversation you would like to ask questions, please post them on the comments panel on your screens. I may not be able to answer, uh, to put all of your questions to our guests, but I, I do hope that there'll be time for some. At the end of the program, for your information, we'll put an email address on the screen for those of you who'd like to be kept abreast of some of the really exciting developments that we're going to hear about tonight. And just to say that, as always, South Hampstead Community and the United Synagogue do not endorse any of the companies which will be discussed in the course of, of this broadcast. So I'd like to start with a story. Sometime towards the end of March, an article appeared in the Times of London about a small multidisciplinary research institute in the Galilee, Kiryat Shimona, in the north of Israel. The institute specializes in biotechnology, computer sciences, plant science, agriculture, and environmental sciences, and by the way, it's a pretty brainy place. Most or perhaps the majority of its staff have PhDs. So the team had previously developed a vaccine against a coronavirus strain that causes bronchial disease affecting poultry. And the safety and the effectiveness of the poultry vaccine had been proven in animal trials that were carried out in Israel's veterinary institute where 80% of the tested chickens were cleared of the virus in six days, compared to only 10% that were inoculated with the currently commercial available vaccine. And then, in a eureka moment, the team suddenly realized that they had in their hands, with a little bit of tweaking, a potential vaccine for the coronavirus that had suddenly erupted across the globe. But they're only a research institute. They had no manufacturing facility or the funds to take this exciting realization further. Enter John Medved, serial entrepreneur and the founder and chief executive of Our Crowd, Israel's most active venture investor and the man who has raised $1.4 billion for 200 startups, primarily Israeli. So, John, Good read evening. the story from here and tell us a bit about our crowd and how you came to be involved in Migal's serendipitous discovery. Well, it's interesting. The same time that you were reading that article in Lynn, I was looking at our papers and it was also reported. And uh, I'm a astute guy. And I, when I see an article, which to my mind looks actionable because I was looking for a vaccine investment, I then went to my partner, Dr. Morris Laster, who runs our medical team, and I said, check it out. And he and the team began a very intense due diligence process, engaged with the research institute, who was in the process of spinning out the company with this technology. And we reached a very quick agreement uh, to invest $12 million. We have uh, launched this as an investment on the R Crowd platform which essentially is a platform to enable our almost 50,000 members from around the globe to choose startup investments that they would like to participate in. They can actually invest amounts that start at $10,000. And the response to this particular uh, opportunity, which is called MIGVAX, it has nothing to do with the MIG jet airplane, it's MIG for MIGAL, which is the name of the research institute in the Galil. The MIGVAX project has now uh, actually generated probably more interest from investors on our platform than anything to date. It's been a, a remarkable ride and we're very excited. And the more we learn about it, the better we feel. It's, it, what, what's interesting is that many of our grandmothers often talked about how chicken soup is like Jewish penicillin. And at a certain point it dawned on me that you know, if we can make some soup, and by the way, this is an oral vaccine, this is not a, a shot, that will somehow cure the entire world and it will come from the Galil, this is a, a great blessing. And it's one of these things where even if someone else, like those great researchers at Oxford or the people at Moderna or others, 
beat us to the punch and get their vaccine ready earlier, that's great. It's good. We all win. Mankind wins. We need a vaccine. So happens, I think our vaccine, as you'll hear shortly, has a lot going for it. Maybe more is a better position. Yeah. Well, they always, they, I, I always understood that chicken that chicken soup was somewhere in this mix over here. And the fact that this started off with chickens is really just absolutely perfect for Israel. It couldn't happen anywhere else in the world. I'd like to turn to, to uh, Dr. Morris Lester. Morris, um, you're the person on the uh, Our Crowd team overseeing the MIGVAX project. And you're, of course, very close to the MIGAL chief executive, uh, David Zidgon and his entire team. So can you tell us in layman's terms um, about this potential vaccine and, and how, it, how it differs from other vaccines under development? Sure. Um, it's an oral vaccine. It's an oral subunit vaccine, which means we're using more than one antigen. Um, and it's based on the chicken vaccine, as we've seen. So I think it's just best if I get a chance to run through the slides that we prepared. Uh, can you see them okay? So there's a picture out from the Miguel Institute. You can see the Golan in the background. Um, but a, a couple of years ago, the Israeli government identified the need for a national center for avian viral vaccines. And the reason was that the currently available vaccine for infectious bronchitis virus, which is a coronavirus, was not working, was not doing the job. And they were scared that certain mutations would happen there and it would make the jump into humans. So four years ago, they established this center. They created a vaccine for the infectious bronchitis virus. And these results became available just as the COVID-19 pandemic emerged. The researchers at the Vaccine Institute then looked at the antigens present on the coronaviruses, whether the IBV, MERS, SARS-CoV-1, and then SARS-CoV-2, and realized it was very, very close, very close match between the antigens that were found on the bronchitis virus as the antigens were found on the COVID-19 virus. And our, and our vaccine is unique is because we're looking at two proteins here. The vast majority of the other people working on the vaccines will be looking at what's called the S protein or the spike protein. That's the part that enables the virus to get into the cell. But not many of them, if at all, are looking at what's called the nucleocapsid protein. And that's the way that uh, the DNA is packaged inside the virus. And what that enables us to do is with a platform technology that was developed at Migal where we use a carrier that stabilizes the antigen or that stabilizes the protein of, from the virus and allows it to get taken up by mucosal membranes. Mucosal membranes are those membranes that you find in your nose and your mouth and your eyes, specifically those sites in which the coronavirus attacks us. And this carrier allows the cells to take up the antigen and present it to our immune system. And it presents it to the immune system in such a way that it gives us three different kinds of immunity. One is called mucosal immunity, which is IgA based. Those means antibodies that are going to be present in the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and that are going to prevent infection following the vaccine. Blood based immunity, or IgG based, are IgGs that run around in your body and your blood. And those will take care of a virus once it infects you. And finally, cell-mediated immunity, that's the kind of immunity where the body detects cells that have actually been infected and then gets rid of them. So by using these three different kinds of antigens, two from the nucleocapsid, one from the spike, and utilizing this carrier approach, we're able to generate an oral vaccine where the vast majority of the other vaccines are also injected which obviously would require a healthcare professional to administer. Uh, this is simply just a little bit of liquid. You take it in your mouth, you switch it around, and you swallow. And because of this carrier approach and the antigens that we're using, we're hitting three different parts of the immune system. And as uh, uh, Rabbi Levin said, 
these results were fascinating in the chickens. These were fa vaccinated chickens. And what you could see in the middle, the commercial avian virus were not able to clear the chickens of viral shedding. Whereas the chickens treated with the MIGVAX within a few days enabled over 80% to no longer have viral shedding. In other words, you're looking at an efficacy rate of about 80%. That stops epidemics. If we had 80% people who were vaccinated to coronavirus, there's no longer a coronavirus pandemic. So currently there are three other candidates in clinical trials, 67 in preclinical development. And the big approaches are mRNA-based vaccines where you inject a piece of genetic material into, into muscle, generally the spike protein. The muscle makes the spike protein. Um, and then the body is then immune primarily via IgG immunization. And that can cause something called enhancement, where when a subject is vaccinated and then sees the virus again, the immune system can actually go crazy and make the person sick. And it's something the regulatory authorities are really, really looking at. Uh, the other approach may be adenoviral delivery, where you're looking at a virus to deliver, um, again, genetic material to, to that the body makes the protein. Those are more expensive, and very often subjects have anti adenoviral immunity. So the question of efficacy um, is very much there, and it is also an expensive manufacturing process. Direct injection of viral proteins, again, you can end up with enhancement, and that is also somewhat of an expensive procedure. Inactivated vaccine is something the Chinese are going after. And the final approach is live attenuated virus, which Obvious has say, obvious safety risks associated with COVID-19. I don't think that's an approach that anyone's really going to use. So our timeline is to start uh, efficacy and safety study in rodents this month. We hope to begin our phase one, two clinical trial this summer and have results uh, from that trial early 2021. We're actively engaging with regulatory authorities to discover what kind of endpoints they're gonna be looking for and what we're gonna to need to do in order to get this thing out there. And as your very own GSK CEO, Emma Wallensley has said, Anthony Fauci said it yesterday, we're gonna need billions of doses and there's gonna to need to be more than one vaccine. So we're all for Moderna working, um, back working, whoever it is, we hope, we get the vaccine, we hope it gets there fast, and we believe we have some significant advantages on the MIGVAX vaccine. One, it is orally based. Two, the efficacy has already been seen in the chickens and we're basically using the same vaccine uh, in the humans with obvious modifications to attack the COVID-19 virus. Based on the chicken results, it should hit three distinct immunological pathways, mucosal, blood-borne and cell-mediated, as described earlier. Because we're using uh, inert proteins, it cannot cause the disease state. And we believe because of the oral uh, administration and because of the mucosal response, we should have less likelihood of toxic enhancement response. And last but not least, because these proteins are made by bacteria, large-scale manufacturing is possible with low cost. So we can literally make, well, the bacteria literally make millions and millions of doses um, in a very, very quick timeline. So the more fermenters we can get going, the more vaccine we can make. And that's the end of my show for now. Uh, and um, I, it sounds to me as if what we have here is something that is radically different in its approach uh, to pretty much everything else which has been done in other places. Are you aware of anyone across the world, because there are huge numbers of people who are chasing the vaccine, who is doing anything of a similar nature? Are you entirely out there on your own? Well, it seems that way is vis-a-vis -vis having an oral subunit vaccine. There are others who are trying approaches via the 
uh, nose and, 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 and squirting things in the nose. Uh, but literally, there's over 100 different programs right now, and, and the numbers keep growing. It's hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, during our discussion with various regulatory authorities, they are intrigued by the oral subunit approach. Uh, so that tells me that we're, uh, we're pretty unique out there. And um, we've been hearing here in the UK a, a number of, uh, from the chief medical officer and, and others, just a, a word of warning, uh, almost kind of like two contradictory sources. The people who are running our front runner here at Oxford University, uh, you know, are saying, well, you know, we think there's probably about an 80 percent um, possibility of success. Uh, and from the chief medical officer and from others in government, we're hearing there may not ever be a vaccine. So what is your perspective in Israel on uh, the likelihood of uh, one of these initiatives actually producing a vaccine that will be robust, that can be taken even by the elderly who some, sometimes apparently need uh, stronger doses, um, and the likelihood of uh, some way in which the world can come back to normality um, because there is a strong workable vaccine? That's an excellent question. And, and, and we really don't know very much about COVID-19 because it's something that literally has burst on the scene in December and maybe even a little bit earlier than that. Um, uh, I think it was a, a pediatric infectious disease physician in England who actually said, we actually don't need the vaccine to be perfect even if it's a 50% efficacy and manages to reduce the level of severity of disease, that's a win. So I think when we're looking at that kind of barrier to entry, I think the odds of us getting something are very, very good. Uh, historically, vaccines have been difficult to develop, which is why many pharmaceutical companies have shied away from doing vaccines. I think the technologies that exist now, whether it be mRNA, vaccine that still has not yet had an approved vaccine, but the technology is promising. Uh, the oral subunit approach that we're taking and others, um, I believe there are enough shots on goal here that someone should get through. Um, Do you know how many um, vaccines are in development around the world, uh, in Israel and around the world? So in Israel, we're aware of uh, three groups. Uh, we are one. Um, the Israel um, Biological Research Institute, which is a government-run facility, um, has a program, but they are really not saying what they have or don't have. They recently announced an antibody against the spike protein for treatment, uh, but they haven't really made any announcements regarding vaccine. And we believe there's another group at Tel Aviv University that may also be working on a vaccine. We haven't heard much about them either. Well, it's really interesting because um, one of the things which seemed apparent to the public uh, was coronavirus brought about an incredible collaboration um, across the world between politicians, uh, countries, governments, uh, and we believed as well that there was a, a huge collaboration between uh, scientists as well in various countries. And certainly there's been a, break a breaking down of some of these silos in terms of disciplines. So over here we've had ventilators who are, that have been manufactured by Ferrari in the Formula, <laughs> the, uh, Formula One race, race team who contributed you know, an incredible collaboration. So we've always had this sense that um, in this particular emergency, all of the scientists would put their heads together and they would share their information, etc. It sounds to me, from what you've been saying just about Israel, uh, that the level of collaboration and sharing of information is not quite what we might have expected. Are people? Is this a, is this about a race to win? No, I actually don't think so. I think that there is um, specifically with, with the vaccine, you have different approaches to to doing something. There's not really something you can share about what one, one group is doing versus another um, as far as the vaccine is concerned. But the fact of the matter is the sequence of the COVID-19 came out within a month after the announcement of the outbreak. 30 mutations have been discovered uh, since then, and that's been uh, shared with. Um, when, when it comes to technology that needs to be used by various parties, 
there is a tremendous amount of sharing going on. I think, though, when we're developing a, a, a oral subunit vaccine um, group in, in Tel Aviv University is developing an injectable version of, of a spike protein, there's really no, there's no need to collaborate on that. It's not, you know, if we needed to, we would, but there's really no, no sense of collaboration or no, no benefit to it for either party. Um, they're just doing different things. And, and do you have a sense, and perhaps this is a slightly un unfair question to ask somebody who's uh, in, in, in Israel, but despite the smallness of population compared to some of the major countries of the world, uh, the recognition that there are some really amazing brains uh, and scientific brains in Israel, do you, have, do you get any impression that other countries are looking to Israel as one of the number one runners in uh, being able to find solutions to coronavirus? Well, absolutely. I think that there's been a tremendous amount of um, innovation that's gone on here, where the, you see, even in the New York Times, there was an article on the front page how the Israeli um, military and defense establishment kind of um, geared up for this uh, disease and, and, and created different solutions that other people are looking for and ordering. Um, one of them, for example, was the creation of a coronavirus testing truck, which Italy just ordered. Um, so as a recent example, um, there were orders from other governments of uh, the LifeCan Ambu bag uh, robotic uh, ventilator. Um, we hear of companies getting orders from abroad for various products that they have and interest in, in, in devices. So absolutely. Thank you, Morris. And that actually leads us on very nicely because I'd like to come back to John um, because I know that you are involved with a number of other initiatives. And I, I wonder if we could just move away from MIGVAX for, for, for the moment uh, and first of all, wish you great success with it. I don't know what sort of percentage you would like to put on the likelihood of success of this particular um, vaccine. Uh, but can you talk to us about the broader corona scene uh, tell us some of the other uh, Israeli activities and companies in which uh, our crowd are involved and some of the exciting stuff which is going on that Morris alluded to. Great. Uh, if, if I can get my sh uh, slides up for sharing, wonderful. That would You're be uh, very, very useful for me. I appreciate that. Um, here we go. You should be able to see now. So... First, I just wanted to say a few words about how we're doing in Israel relative to the crisis. And I think that the answer here in a nutshell is rather well. It's hard to look at 262 deaths and use that phrase, but relative to other countries in the OECD, uh, Israel is doing well on its mortality rate testing. And uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable, actually, when you look at our mortality rate of only one and a half percent of cases. If you look at the curve, we haven't flattened it. We've basically gone to the bottom of the other side. And in fact, this is today's headline in the Times of Israel, where there literally now are only 13 new virus cases over a 24-hour period. And Israel is pretty much back to work. We're all back to school. Most of the uh, commercial and retail services are open. We still aren't open for big sporting events or weddings over 50 people, but there's a real sense that we've, God willing, been through the worst of it so far. And uh, the country has a, a real positive spirit at the moment. Um, when you look at pandemics, you've got to realize that this is not a one-of. There have been pandemics and epidemics over the last century, and unfortunately, we have to get ready for the future pandemic not just the return of this one, but others to come. And Israel is ready because Israel is probably the world's most innovative country. Don't take my word for it, or don't even take the Israeli embassy, go to the World Economic Forum, the folks from Davos. And we're number one in innovative companies and R&D expenditures, number two in venture capital. And so Israel, little Israel with its less than 10 million people is really punching above its weight class. And in particular, there's activity going on in Israel in all of the areas that are of interest relative to today's pandemic. And that relates to not just 
uh, vaccines and sensors or diagnostics and testing or therapeutics, but also continuity and disruption, business continuity, food security. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of Israeli companies who are now active in this area. And it's a particularly interesting and fortuitous time, I think, to be looking at investing because you get a double uh, effect here. On the one hand, everyone knows who's active in venture capital. The best time to make venture investments are in market downturns because as a buyer, you're buying assets that are discount and you're not buying for a one or two month exit. In the venture world, you buy for several years hence. And so from a financial standpoint, it's a good moment. But more importantly, these trends that are now accelerating, the digital trends that the Microsoft CEO said, literally there's been two years of digital transformation accomplished in the last two months. The fact that we're doing this event right now, think of the changes that are happening and that becomes a particularly interesting opening for investors to get involved. Now, there are going to be winners and losers in this, right? The winners are those who are focused on the healthcare or the med tech or industrial automation. It's not a great time to be in the oil industry or commercial real estate. There are certain industries that are going to be fully reformulated, like travel and leisure and others. But what's going to win is going to be AI. Because if you look, for example, at MIGVAX, they're using bioinformatics to do this magic. And artificial intelligence as being perhaps the driver of the new fourth industrial revolution is really going to move this forward. And Israel is very well positioned because we are literally one of the top three countries in the world relative to numbers of AI startups uh, with this key technology. Now, relative to the, you know, the virus, there are huge amounts of testing technology. Big news today about a new little whistle breath tester that can supposedly do tests in literally less than a minute. Uh, there's new therapeutics and new ones coming online all the time. New ventilator technologies. Morris mentioned that one uh, from Inovitech uh, doing the uh, AMBO. And then, of course, there's the vaccine development, which we spent most of the session on. And we're very excited about MIGVAX. We, we really think that we have a shot here. We're leading a $12 million investment. And again, we've had a response from our investors almost unprecedented in the history of our crowd. Um, we talked about the advantages, but I think the most, one of the more significant advantages we haven't really mentioned is how this platform is going to be well suited for potential mutations. Given its bioinformatic design, and the fact that it really is a platform, uh, we have to be ready for those mutations, and that's a, a big part of this. Uh, but in addition to that, we have a bunch of companies, and I'm only going to spend a few minutes, and then we'll get to your questions, because I saw there are a good number of really great questions that I want to tackle together with Morris. We have a bunch of companies that are working right now, either directly or indirectly, on the crisis. One of them is a company called Site Diagnostics, who actually have developed, believe it or not, a blood tester that takes two drops from a pinprick and within 10 minutes gives you a complete blood count or CBC test. Now, this is part of the COVID regimen for anyone who tests positive. And what makes it so exciting for hospitals today is that you can use it to segregate the blood testing from the rest of the central blood laboratory in the hospital or the health center. And this is really, really important. It's important in general. We're raising money for that one right now. POM1 is doing pulmonary function testing because unfortunately, a lot of the survivors of COVID are going to have lung impairment. And instead of now going into a body box, which actually might have some sentimental value to Brits because it looks like an old British phone booth, but it's a rather scary and claustrophobic experience, you can do this not just in a medical center, but you can do it at your doctor's office in a little desktop device. TitoCare is giving a clinical grade telehealth platform that allows a mother at two in the morning to uh, literally get diagnostic quality imaging from ears, nose, throat, lung sounds, heart rate, and whatnot. And then it gets transmitted 
in real time to either a doctor or an AI. This is being used again to help patients who are shelter at home or in quarantine. Cryon is developing bots who write software instead of humans and utilizes a technology called robotic process automation or RPA. They were tasked by Israel's two large health organizations, Maccabi and Klali, the general, and they asked uh, this company to connect the COVID testing data to their central databases. And they were told by their programmers that it would take two months for that connection to happen in terms of code. And they said, we, we don't have two months. We need this now. Cryon got the job done in 48 hours, bringing the bots in. And it was uh, made headlines in the Jerusalem Post. Memed is a company that uses AI to study the immune response and detect whether or not you're being afflicted by a virus or a bacteria. And given their understanding of immune response, they have a hope that this technology will lead to very, very early detection of even asymptomatic COVID-19 patients. Vocal Zoom is using sensor arrays to give you contactless detection ability at airports. So you can not only get temperature without somebody sticking something right up in your face, but also get heart rate and other key uh, signals so we can keep our airports safe. Switch is allowing uh, patients to manage their COVID disease the way that they currently use this product to manage diabetes or oncology. Barcode Diagnostics is using nano encapsulation literally to create a little barcode, which they've now developed for uh, essentially personalized chemotherapy. They're using it to speed up the very important PCR testing that we're using in the labs by a factor of 100 times. And we hope to see that coming out soon. Texi is using your cell phone to get you uh, critical remote technician advice without the remote technician. Nobody's inviting a tech into your home now to get your internet working or your TV working, both things that you're working overtime. But you can use this live video AI-driven technology to get that kind of support. They're actually using it for ventilator support, would you believe? And finally, CyberMDX is using their anti-hacker technology to protect our ventilators, pacemakers, and hospitals, which are now being targeted by hackers who see an opportunity in this crisis. In particular, we're worried about people who will be given uh, 30 minutes to live with a ransom notice that says, pay up or die. And this kind of technology will prevent that. And this raised a, a, a recent round to fight it. And finally, Sense Education, which is a company specializing in complex testing online, has got something that about one and a half billion students who are out of school need pretty bad. So that's just a sampling of the remarkable array of companies coming out of Israel. These are all in our portfolio. Our crowd allows our investors to actually choose these individually or to get involved in funds. And uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. If you want to get information or stay in touch with us, you simply write an email to ukwebinar at rcrowd.com and we'll be happy to put you on our mailing list or to answer any questions you have. Back to you, Rabbi. Thank you. Well, stay stay with us, uh, John and and Morris. Uh, first of all, John, can I say that um, either either you have done this before or you, uh, you really know your companies because that was unbelievably fluent. Uh, and the names of every one of the companies just rolled off your tongue. That's really fascinating. I mean, what a, an incredible panoply of, of innovation and hugely exciting and, and difficult to take it all in, you know, just sitting listening to it because every one of them is such an exciting company. We have a number of questions which have come up um, in our live comments, and I'd like to select a couple of them for, the, for, the, for you, whoever you wish, either John or Morris, to, to address. Uh, but there's one question over here, which comes from Rebets and Lindy Levine, who asks, what do the SARS and MERS COVID outbreaks contribute 
to creating a vaccine for COVID-19. What did we learn from those? Why didn't we get a vaccine that emerged out of that that would have provided the basis for a vaccine now? Morris, why didn't you address that? Well, what happened was the uh, disease went away, essentially. Um, SARS and MERS came, um, and just as uh, unexpectedly come, it disappeared. Uh, but when you look at the, uh, the genetic makeup of the uh, MERS, SARS, and now COVID-19, you realize that there is a tremendous amount of similarities between them. And it is those similarities that we were able to take advantage of in creating the MIGVAX 101. So what the team looked for were uh, areas within these antigens that were uh, conserved across the various viruses. And that meant that it was important to the virus. Um, as, as these viruses evolve, uh, the mutations happen in regions that are less important for them, as it were. The things that are kept generally are kept for a reason, and they're involved in their disease process. So what we looked at were the areas that were actually kept across the various viruses to create both the IBV vaccine and then use the same methodology to create the MIGVAX 101 for humans. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question that comes from... Um... Uh, one of our viewers over here, Sydney Myers, um, who asks, how does your vaccine differ from the one being developed by Stable Tech, which is also an oral vaccine? I'm not familiar with the specific technology. I can look at it, look it up and get back to you on that. Sydney, we would be delighted if you shared with us any information about Stable Tech. That sounds interesting. One of our list, one of our viewers, Justin Kaplan, says this sounds like a low cost item. He's talking probably about the um, the vaccine. Uh, can you start to stockpile it now in case it's approved, so that you can really to, so you are ready to supply the world when we get to go ahead? And if I could just add to that, because I know that there's been a lot of discussion in Oxford, the Oxford vaccine, about skipping a step and already going to manufacturers, etc. Um, taking a risk in terms of um, taking us to the next step, not sequentially, just in case there's the possibility of work to bring us to market more quickly. Is there a way in which you could bring this to market more quickly by taking more risks? Absolutely. I think that the minute we um, validate the approach in, in the animal studies that we're doing right now, uh, the biggest effort underway will be to find additional manufacturers and manufacturing partners that can start working on that process and actually stockpiling the proteins. Because again, they're not that expensive to make, as, as you rightly said. So it would pay to get involved with uh, manufacturers to help us get that up and running uh, simultaneous with the clinical trial. Right. Uh, and um, John, a question for you, and this, will, this comes from somebody who I understand you know well and worked very closely with Leon Blitz here in London. Uh, and he says, uh, are you seeing increased innovation during these times driven by the urgency of the climate for solutions? And if you do, how are you going to be balancing speed with diligence? Great question, Leon, as always. Uh, look, there has been unprecedented amounts of innovation. Uh, crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And innovators really come to the fore. A lot of great companies are often created in crises. And so while there's opportunity, I think Leon is, is spot on that you have to be very careful not just to jump into things because it's a crisis and you throw caution to the winds. The problem is how do you do the diligence, which you must do as an investor, and still move quickly? Because we don't have time. Time is not our friend. So the only answer really is uh, a lot of caffeine and not much sleep. And I can tell you, since I, I see probably more of Morris these days than my wife, and I'm living in the same house with my wife, so that tells you what I'm doing most of the day. Uh, I think many, many entrepreneurs are, are just working overtime because you know, you're inspired. I mean, when we think about it, 
what a great opportunity this is to be creative and work today, to be inspired by saving the world. I mean, you know, mothers say to their children sometimes, you know, sort of wistfully, I hope you grow up and someday you'll save the world. Well, guess what? The people who are on the front lines today doing this innovation, they have a chance of saving the world. We had a question earlier about, well, it, this could bring peace to the Middle East. Peace to the Middle East is too small for this challenge. This is a challenge literally about the future of humanity. And if you want something to get you up in the morning and to get you a little bit out of bed and to, and, and to work a little harder, this is what will we'll do it. At least it works for me. And I think it works for a lot of other uh, innovators. Yes, I know that you've had a very slow day and you've had hardly any time on Zoom and on uh, um, on, on other platforms, etc. I think you told me that this is your 13th hour that you've been going straight during the course of the day. So clearly you are pumped up. Yeah, I am indeed. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Let me, let me take Leon's question a little bit uh, further, if you don't mind. Uh, I mean, there are thousands of initiatives going on in, in countries around the world. It's an absolute explosion. Uh, Israel might be per capita ahead of the game in terms because it's so hugely innovative. Um, but there's lots of stuff going on in lots of places. And there are lots of very clever people in lots of different countries. What forums are there for the for evaluation and peer review? How will the front runners with proven eff efficacy emerge? Well, that's a great question, which I think, uh, you know, Morris can handle. But I'll tell you how we do it. Um, first of all, this isn't our first rodeo. Right, to uh, use an American uh, colloquialism. Um, Israel is particularly good at crises and working through crises and improvising and innovating. And you also become a good judge of these uh, projects by having had a lot of experience. The more you see, the quicker you can make a determination. So, luckily, we have a team we've made already at our crowd over the last seven years almost 30 different medical investments. And we have a very exciting medical portfolio. So the first thing we do is we support the companies that we're already involved in. So we invested in MeMed or in Site Diagnostics or Palm One, who were all directly engaged in this crisis years ago. And so now all we have to do, we don't have to decide you know, on the fly in the heat of the moment whether to support them. We simply need to work with the, our partners where we already are shareholders and raise them the additional money they need to go into battle. Now, the new opportunities that are being brought to us come usually through trusted sources. Very few of them actually come over the newspaper, or over the transom. Most, you know, send us an email, no Morris, no me, no somebody who's in between. And then we can actually do a quicker triage. We know where the source and the genesis of the idea was, and then we turned over to our team of experts. We've got a, you know, medical advisory board of almost a, a minion of some very, very smart guys and uh, women, and they are uh, ready to go. And so they're looking at stuff. Typically, you have to do a quick triage and decide which is the ten percent or twenty percent that's worthy of a, a deeper dive, and then go from there. And is it the case? that the best companies will in fact be the ones that come to the fore? Or is it possible that in a very messy marketplace, um, other factors such as money or branding, or perhaps government endorsement for governments who want to push their particular boat out, uh, would influence the outcomes? And that although there could be some really wonderful and brilliant ideas, it's not going to always be the best companies that are going to win the kudos. Morris? So I think, you know, as far as a vaccine is concerned, you're gonna be judged on the clinical results. And, and this problem is too big uh, for it to be a branding issue. Um, there are other search situations and technologies. Well, yeah, if you have more money and you have a, a better branding, you might win out because you may have an incremental improvement over another technology, but at the end of the day, if you have a compelling technology that, that disrupts the market and does something that's really needed, um, it generally finds its way out, I found. And, and John's had much more experience with that than I, but um, that's what I would say. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think that it's it's not like a new toothpaste or a new diet drink where big advertising budgets can uh, compensate for you know product weaknesses. Uh, this is really going to be a test of what works in the field. And I think it'll be a little choppy in the beginning because again, there's everybody's testing and everyone's using different methodologies and it's going to be messy. But I think ultimately we will know who has the, the, the best solutions. But I, as I, Amora said earlier, it's not going to be one. Uh, I don't think this is a winner take all kind of situation. I think the world will uh, need several vaccines. There was a question from Ian Miller about could we give a written digest or summary of the tech companies so they can access them. And what I wanted to do is to show them, uh, your, your viewers, that all of this material that we've discussed, both about MIGVAX and the other companies, is available online at the R Crowd website. And if I could bring up uh, a screen, I could show you what that's like. And all you need to do to get access to the website is either go to rcrowd.com and sign up, or if you send us an email to that UK webinar at rcrowd.com address, we will arrange access for you so that you can get uh, not just a summary, but a lot of uh, data. You know, there are 20 page analyses written there, there are slideshows for each company, uh, and quite a lot of uh, information available. We believe very much in the model of open innovation. And once again, while we certainly are not able to endorse any of the products which are being spoken about, um, we are going to put on our last slide tonight after this, uh, after we have finished this uh, session shortly, and there'll be a specially created email uh, and you can use that to get more information directly from uh, directly from John. Uh, well, well, they're, they're asking the question, is the webinar being recorded for others who would like to watch? The answer is yes, it is. And it will be available on YouTube and on Facebook uh, after this evening, pretty much immediately after the uh, after the um, uh, this interview is over, this conversation is over. So, yes, it, ha it has been recorded. Um, so let me just come back to a, a couple of uh, final questions over here. I want to come back for a moment uh, to, to MIGVAX. One of the big things which happened, and if, uh, forgive me for coming back to Oxford, but that's what dominates our press over here because they're the front runners and you know, all the hopes are pinned on them, etc. And one of the things they did straight away was they tied up with AstraZeneca uh, so they would have a major organization company capable of manufacturing, capable of distributing, et cetera, all tied up at a very early stage, even while they're still experimental and only just starting their human clinical trials. Why have you not done something of a similar nature in relation to MIGVAX, which in every respect, based upon what you have told us, sounds in every possible way as promising as the Oxford uh, vaccine? Well, the Oxford vaccine comes from the Jenner Institute, which has a many, many year history of, of developing vaccines for humans. Um, Migal had been in the veterinary space. We just set the company up barely. We're just getting the funding in and, and, and we, we need to focus on getting this into the animal trials. And I promise you that one of the first um, activities of the company will be to actually try and get um, a partner like that. Um, AstraZeneca is an English company. The, the only equivalent would be Teva. Teva is not as um, experienced in making vaccines as AstraZeneca has been. Uh, we hope that Teva will be interested in our product. Um, we'll have to go find the partner. That's for sure. Yeah, but by the way, we, we have an initial partner already working with us. We haven't disclosed that in, in Israel, helping us create the initial uh, materials. but. What happens with all Israeli startups is that we go through a very, very quick process of finding the right partners abroad. And frankly, it's webinars like this and getting the news out that works in strange and mysterious ways. Somebody asked a question earlier, said, does Bill Gates know about this? Because now we know more than Bill Gates on the question bar. Turns out that, you know, we had a discussion already with people at the Gates Foundation. We are talking to people all over the world in various government uh, uh, 
agencies and whatnot. And we hope and, and are pretty confident that over time, we will be engaged with the right kind of pharmaceutical partners. And anybody who would like to make introductions, please do. We welcome that kind of input. Okay, I have a final question for, for, for the two of you. There's an old saying in the world of venture capital investment that the lemons ripen before the plums. Uh, you have a whole portfolio of, uh, of companies. Um, what is your guess, two parts to this question, what is your guess, number one, of what percentage of your companies that are involved in coronavirus in the broadest sense, as you've outlined it to us, John, what percentage of them do you think will actually come to fruition uh, and actually be um, you know, success successful companies as opposed to simply not actually shaping up? And the second, uh, and, and for the purpose of this, this, uh, this evening, the more important question for us is what is, if you were, in the same way that Oxford have wanted to put a percentage on what they believe is the likely positive outcome, they're talking about 80%, what would be your gut percentage that you want to put on a successful outcome for uh, MIGVAX? Well, Oxford has said that they're expecting an 80% chance of success. God yes. bless them. I, I hope they're right. Um, I'm not going to take that question, Morris. That's above my pay grade. Are you going to handle that? <laughs> well, you can, talk, you can talk about your portfolio. Okay, so I can talk about the portfolio. Look, we, we really believe that we have a shot and uh, a good shot on goal. As uh, Morris said, that's an appropriate uh, metaphor for use in, in the UK. Um, but it's a, it's a shot that one must take. And one must always, in venture capital investing, take a portfolio approach because you have failures. And if you look at our overall portfolio of 200 companies, we've had about 20 failures so far. 20 companies have closed their doors. That's 10%. About 10%, which by the way is very, very low in venture capital. We've had 38 exits, meaning 38 of our companies have been bought or sold or gone IPO. And so our, our ratio of successes to uh, failures on the overall portfolio is positive. Whether that will continue on the corona portfolio, I'm not sure, but I can share with you one piece of sort of interesting uh, information is that in our medical portfolio of the near 30 companies that Dr. Morris Lasser and his team, we haven't had a single complete failure yet. We haven't had one that's closed its doors and we have had several successes and more on the way. So uh, these guys do a very, very good job of sifting through the data, looking at the technologies, connecting with their worldwide network of uh, other physicians and clinicians. And uh, we're optimistic. And I think that, you know, first of all, I want to salute you in the United Synagogue for putting this session on. I think this has been, I mean, we're doing webinars and forums like this all over the world, all the time. This was one of the most professionally managed, technology supported, and I dare say Hollywood quality and better, or maybe BC, BBC quality and better hosted. And uh, anytime you would like us to come back, we'll be delighted because this Thank was- Thank you very great. much, uh, John. We are actually open for investment. <laughs> We'll talk about that. <laughs> so, since, since you have, a, as you've just explained to us, a limited pay grade, we're going to have to turn finally to, to Morris. Uh, I asked the question about your gut instinct, if you could put a percentage on your sense now of where you are at this early stage. You're still only dealing with animals. You haven't moved to human trials yet. But on, on everything that you know about this uh, MIGVAX, what is your sense, Morris, that we are going to, what percentage do you want to put on the likelihood that it will be a success? Rather than I put a percentage, what I'd rather say is that I think that it has a lot of compelling arguments going for it. Uh, the fact that it, it worked in the chickens in, a, in an environment where the current uh, commercial vaccine uh, doesn't work, it makes a lot of sense to do. Um, certain portions of it in terms of the carrier has been uh, used in previous clinical studies and shown that it, that it can work. Um, in a lot of ways, it, it just 
when 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 I heard the technology, at first I was skeptical. You know, something coming out of me, Galvin. I was like, you know what, this is a really good approach to uh, developing a vaccine. I think we got a good shot at it. I don't like, don't, I don't want to get to a number, but I think it's definitely worth doing. Definitely. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for a really really fascinating session, and thank you for your willingness to to engage with us. Uh, and um, John, it just sounds like there's so many fascinating things going on. We'd love to come back again and look at some of the others, perhaps in, in more detail another occasion. Uh, we'll get some feedback from, from our viewers and see whether they, whether they are asking for more. But if, if, the, if the public are braying for more of John and Morris, then we'll be happy to provide it. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, and a uh, very big thanks as well to Richard Verber and David Nielsen, who got uh, of the United Synagogue, who have been behind the scenes, who have been ma managing the technology uh, for this um, uh, really smooth uh, interactions of showing slides, etc. Uh, and they've been working really hard at this. So thank you so much to the two of you. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to say a very big thank you to journalist Paul Martin, one of the members of our synagogue who introduced us uh, to John and then to Morris and the facilitator of this event. And last but not least, I'd like to say thank you to all of the audience who've been watching. We don't know how many numbers there are just yet or where you're watching from, although I did see that we do have at least one person watching us from New Zealand. Uh, and I know there's some from the United States of America. I could guess that we have a few in Israel. It's a pretty good guess that we have quite a number here in the United Kingdom, but it's been really great to be able to share these uh, 45 minutes together with you. And I wish you all a very good night. You can see here on the screen, which will remain up, the special um, email address uh, that will go directly through to, to John and his team for further information. So good night to you all, and thank you. The broadcast will be available on Facebook and YouTube for those who are un unable to join us tonight. <laughs>